This video is brought to you by Practical Music Theory for the Rock Guitarist, my new book which is a comprehensive guide to all aspects of music theory necessary for playing rock guitar. From blues to the cycle of fifths, from understanding and using modes to choosing the right notes for a melodic solo, from pentatonic scales to chord construction and keys, it's all covered in a clear and concise manner. With accompanying video demonstrations, jam tracks and tabs, you learn to use the knowledge you gain in accessible ways that make sense for less than the cost of a few guitar lessons. Check out the link in the description for more details. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. It's Tuesday today, so we're doing a top five list, and as you've already seen the thumbnail and the uh, the video title, no sense uh, messing around. We're talking about parts casters today, famous ones at that. Um, some people will define a parts caster as being a guitar that is made from, um, you know, kind of aftermarket parts that you then bolt together and, and create a new guitar out of. But I'm widening the definition just slightly to include guitars which are made of cannibalized bits and pieces of other guitars, not necessarily just a, a brand new um, neck that you buy and a brand new body that you buy. You know, sometimes uh, a parts caster can be a guitar made out of parts of other guitars. Many iconic players have had stellar careers with guitars built to this recipe, and I thought we'd take a look at five of what I think are the most significant today, starting with... Steve Morse, Frankenstein, Telecaster. Yes, the Steve Morse, Frankenstein, Telecaster. Uh, Steve bought it brand new in 1967, and at some point uh, stripped off the uh, the black finish to reveal the natural wood. He also t uh, took the neck off and fitted it with a Strat neck. Let's see if we've got a picture of... Uh, that guitar there yeah well you can't really see the headstock there but it is a strap neck on there um in the neck pos in the neck position we have a uh, i think a gibson paf which seems to be reversed and that, i believe that came from a 335 bridge position a fender humbucker which obviously that meant getting rid of the uh, the fender telecaster bridge assembly um you know so uh, a tunematic bridge was uh, kind of installed and then that trapeze tailpiece at the back comes from i believe a 12 string guitar that uh, steve bought in a pawn shop um the, the lipstick pickup, like the neck pickup, the traditional Telecaster neck pickup, was then moved down to um, sit next to the bridge pickup, and we have finally a strap pickup uh, placed uh, in between the lipstick and the um, and the, the neck humbucker there. Um, so we've had a strap neck fitted and stripped the finish off, tunematic bridge and tailpiece, um, various different pickups added, jumbo frets. Um, added into the to the Stratocaster neck so a real mongrel of a guitar but it's the guitar that you hear for a large part of Steve's career uh, all those classic Dixie Dregs albums and you know the Steve Morse band um, he was using this guitar I believe up until 89 I think the last album that this got used on was the High Tension Wires album and that was kind of around about the time that he was um, in conversations with Music Man and the signature model kind of thing was uh, beginning to come out so yes the Steve Morse Frankenstein Telecaster, you don't get much more of a bits and pieces mongrel parts caster guitar than that. Next, Eddie Van Halen, Frankenstrat. Yeah, no list of parts casters would be complete without uh, Eddie's Frankenstrat. It has an ash body and a maple neck that were both, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they were just parts that were, were bought separately. I don't think they came from other guitars, but um, you know, it had. Um, a Gibson and I think later a, a Seymour Duncan humbucker put into the bridge and um, you know if we take a look at, the, at uh, another picture of it here we go there it is in a later paint job the paint job was created by spray cans and uh, I, I think either electrical tape or or gaffer tape or whatever you know to, to kind of mask bits off and create the the stripey finish but you know you all know about this guitar with the um, you know the kind of the, the pickup selector switch uh, stuffed into the middle pickup uh, route and an, an unconnected neck single coil pickup that doesn't go anywhere and there's there are many more people who can talk expertly about uh, this guitar than I can um, so you know go and search out some videos but you know it is an iconic 
absolutely legendary, um, you know, Frankenstein, Stratocaster, parts caster, mongrel bits and pieces guitar that, you know, if I hadn't put this on the list, people would have been shouting at me. So there we go. The, uh, the Eddie Van Halen Frankenstrat, possibly, possibly the world's first super strat. Um, let me know what you think on that one. But there you go. Let's have a look and see what's next. Eric Clapton, Blackie. Yes, Blackie, Eric Clapton's main guitar, and, uh, you know, for many years. And personally, I don't think he's ever had a better Strat sound than he got out of this guitar. In 1970, Eric bought six Stratocasters from uh, the Showbud shop in Nashville. And he gave three of them away. Uh, one to George Harrison, one to Pete Townsend, and another one to Steve Winwood. And then he uh, took the other three and took the best bits of them and uh, assembled Blackie. Um, it was his main guitar, pretty much exclusively his uh, his only guitar that he used, I believe, from uh, about 1974 to 85. And as I say, he's um, he, I don't think he ever got a better Strat sound. Uh, the, the irony of it is that I don't think his playing was necessarily um, at its peak during that period. Occasional little kind of um, bursts of, of fire. Uh, let's have another look at it. Have we got another picture here? Uh, there we go. Yeah, there's the back view as well. Um, occasional little bursts of fire, like the solo on um, Roger Waters' Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking. Well, all, all the guitar work on that album uh, demonstrate, I think, what a great sounding guitar this is. And that um, Carl Perkins uh, rockabilly kind of session thing with... Um, you know George Harrison again and uh, Ringo Starr. You 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 know that uh, that thing. Go and check it out on YouTube. Great sounding Strat sound out of that guitar on all of those things. And um, you know a real mongrel of a parts caster built by Eric himself or probably his guitar tech. I don't know, uh, but yeah, iconic parts caster guitar had to be on the list. Next, David Gilmore, Black Strat. Yeah, any guitar that you can just refer to by its um, its model and its colour as in the Black Strat, and people know what you mean, um, that's got to have some kind of legendary status, doesn't it? David Gilmore's main guitar um, for a long time. Uh, it was bought in 1970. It's a, it was a 69 Strat originally, um, and it's had various necks over the years. Let's have another uh, look at another picture of it. There he is, there it is being used. Various necks with uh, rosewood and maple fretboards, over the years, um, a Gibson PAF pickup was added, um, I think, between um, the two of the existing single coils. I don't think anything was removed. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I seem to remember that being the story. Um, so it's had a Gibson PAF added and then removed. Um, a Carla uh, Trem added in the 80s and then later removed. And uh, that meant that there was uh, a gaping big hole where the uh, Carla had been installed and it had to be... Um, is it Carla or Kayla, by the way? I've always thought Carla, but let me know. Um, yeah, that meant there was, um, you know, kind of an area to be filled. Uh, the uh, the hole that, that uh, Carla, Kayla, Trem had been sitting in. Um... You know, so it's had loads of necks, loads of pickup swaps, and you know the the famous shortened tremolo arm, and apparently the only original parts on this body, according to Mister Wikipedia, uh, the uh, the body, the the slab of wood that is the body, uh, the pickup selector switch, and the bridge plate. Everything else has been swapped out, probably multiple times in the intervening uh, period. Um, this guitar was sold at auction in 2019 for somewhere in the region of four million dollars and uh yes <laughs> a lot of money a lot of money for a guitar but it is an iconic one um the uh the david gilmore black strat again another iconic parts caster Next. Bruce Springsteen, Esquire slash Tell. Yes. Now, information is a bit scarce on this guitar, Bruce Springsteen's Telecaster or Esquire. Um, when you look closely at the, uh, the Born to Run album cover, uh, you can, I believe, see that it is... Um, labelled as an Esquire, uh, you know, which is a single pickup Telecaster, as we know. Uh, but this obviously isn't a single pickup guitar, and there's that kind of weird sort of thing going on in the middle of the scratch plate. That is, um, apparently it was like that when Bruce got it. He bought it in uh, when he was 22 years old, apparently, and he used it right up until about 2005, when it was just kind of getting basically too tired. Uh, he paid £185 for it, and it was a used guitar at that point. It had been owned by um, a record company, apparently. 
I don't know which one. If you do, leave it in the comments. And it had four pickups installed, which I think is what that um, on the uh, Born to Run album cover. You can see that kind of weird sort of shenanigans going on on the uh, on the pick guard. Four pickups installed and four separate outputs. Now the reason for that was that session musicians could use that guitar and plug into four channels on on a desk and uh, earn four times the, um, the 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 union rate. Apparently, that, those were the rules. You know, so uh, but all of those extra electronics um, that were fitted to it to enable that uh, meant that um, the the guitar was very very light because of the wood that was removed uh, which made it you know a, a favorite of Bruce's uh, you know he, he spends quite a long time on stage he's known for it you know kind of hours and hours on stage and a heavy guitar is not necessarily what you want in that kind of situation so it's um, it's got a swamp ash body and uh, I believe that is from a telecaster again if you know more about this than I do, then please leave comments down below. But it's not a body that was originally um, mated to that Esquire neck, uh, so hence why it's a parts caster. And again, it's had pickup swaps and um, all kinds of stuff uh, swapped out over the years. It's a real mongrel of a guitar, and um, as I say, Bruce used it right up until uh, 2005. So there you go. Those are my. Um, what I think are the most significant, or I think most significant, um, parts casters in rock history. Let me know what your list is down in the comments section. Let me know what you think of my list. Uh, let me know if you think I've got any wrong. You usually do. You usually do when, when I get something, um, when, I, when I say something wrong. Uh, but um, if you know better than me, down in the comments that's where to leave it but that is the video for today folks hope you've enjoyed this little uh, look at some um, i think really rather enticing and lovely guitars and if you have please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already done so i'm going to drop me a like as well while you're at it don't forget the live stream every friday at 5 p.m uk time we drink beer and talk about stuff guitars music whatever great way to kick off the weekend i'd love to see you there if you can make it but for now i'll bid you all a good day and say thank you so much for watching thank you for your time look after yourselves folks stay well stay safe and above all stay sane bye for now <laughs>